I uh, appreciate the opportunity. I some great sessions this morning as I was able to to join those and listen in. And and I would just say that all of all that my colleagues and friends shared before lunch sets an important context in which to view the rural health care landscape. And it's a context that can't be overlooked. Let me make sure that we've got the screen shared. All right. Um, it, it can't be overlooked or overemphasized either one. So I'd, I'd just like to round out the discussion a little bit by looking at the rural health provider infrastructure that exists to serve our rural populations and all the challenges and the disparities that have already been mentioned. Now, while I'm certain that there are still examples of country docs out there and sole propri uh, proprietary or provider independent physician practices, you know, still making house calls on the way home or still delivering babies uh, at the local ER when mama didn't make it out of town in time, I expect there are uh, fewer than there once were. But there are still a number of independent physician practices in our rural towns who still staff the ER when it's needed. They still make hospital rounds on their patients before they're going into the office in the morning. So just because they may not be a part of one of the rural provider designations that I'll be highlighting this afternoon, that doesn't mean that they don't still play an important role in the healthcare landscape that we'll be looking at. Uh, it, it's, it's a landscape or an infrastructure, if you will, in which rural healthcare is provided. Most of our rural communities have a system largely made up of small hospitals and clinics that, and these small hospitals and clinics get special treatment in terms of reimbursement from our key public payers like Medicare and Medicaid. And what you see on this map is in essence, the rural health safety net. Uh, to declutter the map just a little, you have three spe specially designated providers, each including a link to a fact sheet at the Medicare Learning Network for greater detail, as I'm sure you'll have access to these slides later. Uh, feel free to access those links, uh, those links on the Medicare Learning Network, and, and you'll get a lot more detail on each of these designated providers. The first map you see is the critical access hospitals. Uh, created in the Balanced Budget Act of 1997 is a special designation under Medicare for facilities with a limitation on the length of stay, uh, which was is now an average 96 hours, and then also a bed limit of 25 beds or less. And of around the 2,000 or so rural hospitals, more than 1,350 are critical access hospitals. In most rural communities, Small rural hospitals and critical access hospitals often serve as the linchpin of the healthcare system. Now, that being said, we are seeing an increase in system consolidation. We're seeing a mix of systems in some places that are urban systems with some rural providers. There are some mixed rural and urban systems. And then there are some private management affiliations of, and groups of hospitals. But there's still a significant number of local county or city owned and managed hospitals that are out there. The second map you see there is of the rural health clinics. Rural health clinics were created by the Rural Health Clinic Services Act back in 1977. Rural health clinics received certification based in part on their location from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services. Now these are clinics either independent or a provider base as part of a rural hospital that gets special all-inclusive rate payments and are required to have not only physicians, but also uh, nurse practitioners or physician assistants. The third map you see there is the map of the Rural Federally Qualified Health Centers or what we call FQHCs. Let me uh, back up just a little bit here. There we go. Um, the Federally Qualified Health Centers. The, administered by HRSA's Bureau of Primary Health Care, these were established in 1960s as part of the War on Poverty, uh, a demonstration program to provide access to health and social services for medically underserved and disenfranchised populations in urban and rural areas. Now, FQHCs provide a menu of services and are required to see all patients regardless of their ability to pay. They may be in rural or metro areas, but somewhere close to 40% of the 14,000 sites that are out there are in rural areas. 
I guess my point that I want to make is that we use a variety of federal policy levers like reimbursement to support rural hospitals and clinics and the providers who practice there. But you know, there is another large set of facilities that play a key role in rural areas caring for elderly Medicare and dual eligible Medicaid patient populations, and that's nursing homes, both skilled nursing facilities and uh, nursing facility level of care. There's also assisted living, memory care, a number of providers that are out there taking care of our elderly. And uh, there's a link there to this, some great information on the Rural Health Information Hub. Uh, that's, that's our office's one-stop shop for all information rural. So uh, be sure and avail yourself to that information. Uh, so that it's, it's not an exhaustive list of rural providers that I'm gonna be visiting with you about. There's also other rural providers such as tribal clinics and hospitals, uh, VA clinics and hospitals, there's home health, hospice, uh, OT, uh, speech therapy, physical therapy. There are pharmacies, dentists, mental and behavioral health providers, community health aides, promotors. The, there are a lot of folks doing a lot of great work with our rural populations. But given that, any discussion of the rural health care landscape must take into consideration the maldistribution of health care workforce. Uh, you hear different numbers uh, spouted, but there's 18% of the population in our country is rural, but it's only somewhere around 10% of primary care and, and less than 7% of specialty care practitioners such as oncologists. Um, so there is a maldistribution of healthcare resources and healthcare providers. I saw another point that says about 5% of rural counties have no family physicians in them. And it's not just about healthcare provider infrastructure. It's also about what you've already heard today, this morning. But I, and I wanna remind you of that again with this slide. It's what I've kind of glibly called the five Ds. And it's uh, death rates, disparities, distance, dollars, and departures. I just wanna remind you, people in rural areas live three years uh, less than people in urban areas on the average with rural areas having higher death rates for heart disease and stroke. Rural women face higher maternal mortality rates in rural areas. There's also the demographics or the disparities there. The rural residents face higher rates of tobacco use, physical inactivity, obesity, diabetes, and high blood pressure. There's also the disparity of providers. Rural populations face greater challenges with mental health and behavioral health and have un, uh, a limited access to mental health care. Uh, there's also the, the factor of distance. I, uh, a friend of mine in Oklahoma always said that, yes, we have a public transport system that we pay for with our tax dollars. It's in Washington, DC. Out here in, in uh, rural areas, there's no, there's very little infrastructure for public transportation. And so long distances come into play because not every, while the, you know, you might be led to believe that everybody drives a Ford pickup, not everyone has transportation. And so it makes it difficult to access emerging, emergency care, specialty care and preventive care. And then also the, the idea of the dollars. When you think about uh, the demographics, the economics of rural areas, rural populations are more likely to be uninsured or underinsured and have fewer affordable health insurance options than uh, maybe our urban counterparts. And the final, final D I have is the, the word departure. And, uh, and by that, I wanna point out that since January of 2010, there have been 130 rural hospitals that have closed. Uh, 43 of those were critical access hospitals uh, getting cost-based reimbursement from Medicare. And yet still they were so financially vulnerable and it was so critical that they, they were unable to maintain access in their community. 87 of those hospitals were non-critical access or prospective payment system hospitals with other various uh, rural Medicare designations. And then I would also point out the, the map there on, on your left is that many more hospitals are still at a high risk of financial, financial distress, even if they still are in their community right now. 
But there is still innovation taking place in rural healthcare landscape. It's not all, it's not all negative uh, things that are happening. Uh, historically, there's the uh, demonstrations that we've done like the Frontier Extended Stay Clinic, the Frontier Community Health Integration Project just recently closed. Uh, there's the Rural Community Hospital demonstration. Uh, rural state innovation models that, that can be pointed at is these are coming up with some great innovative ideas that are working and are successful. There's also ongoing rural value-based initiatives at uh, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid, such as the uh, ACO investment model, uh, good in routes into rural areas, the next generation ACO model, uh, state uh, located models like the Vermont all-payer ACO model, and then there's the Pennsylvania Rural Health Model that we'll talk about in just a minute that's testing global budgeting uh, in a rural area. And so since I've touched on the Pennsylvania model and the present reality affecting the rural healthcare landscape, let me just close my part of this presentation by making a few observations about the rural challenges and opportunities that we're facing now during this coronavirus pandemic. And uh, while what we're seeing this week in rising numbers in rural states may dispose of the potential advantage of the idea of we're more distanced than each other, than maybe our urban counterparts, I want you to look at that uh, left chart there from our friends at UNC. Um, you, what you see, that top line is Western Kansas and Oklahoma. And what we're seeing in many rural communities is exactly what I thought we'd see. The lines have shifted to the right. In other words, they're later than Manhattan and Chicago and other places like that. But the, the rate of that we're seeing is dramatic. And you can tell by the, the, the shift on that line, that top line, the pandemic has shined a glaring light on other issues that have been long sustained and long acting. Uh, issues such as racial and ethnic and economic health disparities that have been around in rural for a long time. And I've got to admit the reality that we look at right now, the reality that has been uncovered is extremely ugly. We also wanna think about or rethink possibly about access and capacity in rural areas. That's one thing that the idea of has surge capacity, having, having places for folks to go if they have the virus, uh, the reality uh, there is that the rural healthcare landscape may need some rethinking as we look at the need for access and surge capacity. And then a few months of pandemic accomplished uh, in telehealth, what years of advocacy could not do for the utilization of telehealth in rural areas. And perhaps there are, are alternative payment models and system designs that will better align with the need to maintain access to quality healthcare services in the rural healthcare landscape. We need to remain open to testing those. And a good example of that is the uh, Pennsylvania Rural Health Model. Looking at global budgeting, it, uh, it was not surprising, but eye-opening that as we looked at those hospitals that had global budgets, they were more resistant to the fluctuations we saw with the pandem pandemic when they, uh, folks started doing away with uh, elective surgeries and folks start, stopped showing up for outpatient appointments and things like that. And so these are things, when, when these demonstrations come along, we need to uh, avail ourselves of looking at those opportunities. I thank you for the chance to uh, look at the infrastructure, both from workforce and from the facilities that are out there. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here today.